can be seated. Uh, the title for the message is Christ the Victor, and um, that actually, some of you might be familiar with the term, uh, this is a, uh, there's multiple theories of the atonement of Christ, and Christus Victor uh, is one of those understandings of what Christ came to do whenever he was laying down his life and rising again. And Christ the Victor is just the English uh, version of that. And I was looking up this teaching, and I read a helpful illustration, um, and it goes like this. Imagine a city under siege. Uh, the enemy that surrounds the city will not let anyone uh, leave, uh, will not uh, let anyone get supplies, and in fact, supplies are running low. The citizens are fearful, but in the dark of night, a spy sneaks in uh, through the enemy lines. He's rushed to the city to tell the people that in another place, the main enemy force has been defeated. The, the leaders have already surrendered. But here, where they are, People have not surrendered. The news has not reached them yet. And so the evil forces continue to uh, cause them great difficulty. But it's only a matter of time until the besieging troops receive the news and lay down their weapons. Similarly, we may see now, seem now to be surrounded by the forces of evil, sin, death a hatred for Christ, a hatred for His Word and His ways. And yet, the enemy was defeated at Calvary. Uh, things are not the way that they seem to be, and it's only a matter of time until it becomes clear that the battle, though is not over, has already been won. Let's dive into the scriptures this morning and see how that is true. We're going to start with the Father's love in verse 27 and 28. And this highlight of the Father loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Now I'm leaving and going to the Father. Now, Again, this is connecting a little bit to last week's message. And Jesus had informed the disciples uh, that upon his resurrection, uh, that, that he is going to teach them, but also the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, is going to come and lead them into all truth. And, and Jesus here let them know that, hey, I'm going to speak plainly to you, and then you will learn more about the Father well, the truth is, when Jesus taught, he taught in parables to the great crowds, right? But he took his disciples aside and taught them more clearly that they would understand the parables. And yet, there were things that Jesus taught the disciples that they still could not comprehend. It was beyond their understanding at the time. And so Jesus here now tells them, uh, you're going to hear me teach plainly about the Father in due time. That time is coming soon. And there's likely two reasons that, he's, that they're going to understand more plainly about the Father. One, he's going to speak clearly to them, plainly to them, not in figures of speech. But the second reason I think that they're going to understand is because the Holy Spirit is going to come and lead them into understanding the things that Christ has taught them. In fact, he's going to bring to memory all the things that he's been teaching them over these three years of discipleship so that they come into a spiritual understanding of his teaching. He also informs them that they will pray to the Father in the name of the Son. Now, we've already talked about this, but this is praying in, in, in the will of Christ. This is praying for the glory of Christ. This is praying it with Him in mind and not primarily ourselves in mind, but primarily with Christ's purposes on this earth in mind. And He says that He's not going to pray on their behalf. I, I don't want you to misunderstand this. He's not saying that He won't pray because in John 17, our next chapter... He spends almost the entire chapter praying for the disciples. But what he is saying is that I'm not saying that I have to go before the Father on your behalf only, but that you yourselves can go before the throne of God and pray. Why? Because you have such an intimate relationship with God because God has set His love on you and you have turned from this world and loved 
him and have loved me. Therefore, you can go directly before the Father in prayer. This loving relationship in which you and I, as well as disciples of Christ, we have access directly to the Father. Why? Because what Christ has done for us on the cross has opened up heaven's gates in order that you and I, even now while walking this earth, can go before the Holy of Holies and cry out to our God. In fact, Look at Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 with me, and I want to contrast with you. The Old Testament had some beautiful connections with God that the people had, no question, but it was much more limited to what you and I have access to now under the new covenant because of what Christ did for us and the victory that He won for us. Look with me at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, we since we have confidence to enter the holy places. This is unheard of in the Old Testament. Only one guy once, one time a year could go into the holy of holies and only a limited number of people could go into the holy places. Not everyone was welcome there. But here, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're welcome into the holy presence of God. That ought not to be taken for granted when we look at the thousands of years that the Jews did not all get welcomed into God's presence like this. And notice, it's by the blood of Jesus versus the blood of animals. Because the blood of animals could not procure for us what Jesus did. It was Jesus' blood, His sacrifice, His victory on the cross that opened up so that you could go into the holy places in God's presence. Not only that, look at verse 20. By the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. Again, Old Testament language here. Jesus is better than the sacrifices. Jesus' body is better than the temple. His church is better than the temple. That veil that separated people from the Holy of Holies has been torn in two on the cross. That was where the victory was won. And that being torn open, it, we now, through the body of Christ being torn for us, we are welcomed into the holy presence of God. What a victory Christ has won for us. Now, we're not done. Look at verse 21. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Listen, the high priests that were over the Old Testament uh, temples and synagogues and all that, they were fallible men like all of us here. They were not a perfect high priest. They had to atone for their own sins, but Jesus Christ was the great high priest who had no sins, had no needing of cleansing before God. And He is our high priest now, perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Look with me at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Draw near to what? Draw near to God your Father. Draw near into His holy presence. And with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. This is something that the blood of goats and lambs and bulls never could do. They could never cleanse the conscience of the sinner. Never. They were all for external but they could not do an internal work, but the blood of Jesus is the more perfect sacrifice. And in trusting in Christ, um, not only does God declare you righteous, but He also begins that work of sanctifying and cleansing you so that you, when you enter into the presence of God, you're not trembling because of your sin and judgment, but knowing, I've been cleansed. I've been forgiven. My conscience is clean before God because of His mercy and grace toward me. What a greater sacrifice. What a greater presence that we're able to enter into because of Christ's victory on the cross. I could not help but think of one of my favorite hymns, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, How Vast Beyond All Measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. Listen, we should, we should remind ourselves that we are lowly sinners, in need of forgiving, in need of cleansing, but we ought not to neglect what God has done. He has put His love on us. He has made us His special treasure, His special people, that we would draw near and delight in Him. 
And hopefully that is what we're doing every Lord's Day when we gather here. But not just every Lord's Day, but also every day in our homes, in our places of work, in our drive on the way to school, um, whether you're on the bus or you're driving yourself. Uh, What Christ has won for you, do you and I pursue this, this presence of God in prayer? Uh, specifically, time with God. Uh, 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 putting down your phones, uh, turning off the video games, taking your mind off of all the stress at work, uh, all the difficulty of uh, raising children, education, all the things that surround us, right? Are we, are we entering into that holy of holies in the presence of our Father in prayer? Listen, God loves you so much that He saved you and and through the death of Christ has provided a way for you to come into His presence in special communion with Him. One of the things in some of the small groups that I'm a a part of, been a part of throughout the years in ministry is is men often will confess, I don't know how to pray. I, I don't know what to say. I've been there. I'm still growing in my understanding of prayer. Prayer is a discipline. It's not something that you're just automatically, oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the world's best prayer. Prayer? For, you, you know what I'm trying to say. Listen, it's a discipline. It's something that we ought to give ourselves to. And hopefully when you came in, not only did you get a bulletin and a warm welcome here at Heritage, but hopefully you got this gift Listen, these were free to the church, um, and so we want to give them away freely. And the title of the book is Praying the Bible. The best way to pray is let the Bible teach you the words that you ought to cry back out to God. And in this book, if you didn't get one, feel free to raise your hand. We have some extras. We want to get these in your hand. I see one hand, two. There's a handful. So make sure you get one of these before you leave. They were free to us. Take them with you and dive into the Scriptures and let the Scriptures teach you when you get in the presence of God how we ought to pray before Him. And listen, you ought not to feel ashamed that you don't know how to pray. No one knew how to pray. God teaches us all how to pray. But what a wonderful victory Christ has won that you and I welcomed beyond the veil in His presence to cry out to our God. And there's a reason to look at the next point. The disciples' weakness is, is a reason. Our weakness is a reason that we need that presence of God, need to be in prayer. Look with me at verse 29 and 30. His disciples said, Ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. The disciples think that Jesus has spoken plainly to them, and, and I take their, their response to be a, a measure of faith here. But I, I think these disciples are being a bit presumptive here. I, I, I don't think this is the plain teaching Jesus is referring to. I think this is disciples once again getting ahead of themselves. Because look at what Jesus does in verse 31 and 32. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? After, after all you've seen, after all you witnessed, now you're ready to set your stake in with me? I don't think so. Look at verse 32. Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own house, and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. So I, I don't think Jesus is questioning whether the disciples have faith or not here. What he is doing, though, is he is questioning the strength of of their faith, and if it's able to endure what they're about to go to, Jesus being crucified. In fact, exactly what Jesus said here is exactly what occurred, which is exactly what was prophesied hundreds of years prior. Mark 14, 27 through 29, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now look, presumptive Peter, right, said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. (laughs) And Peter gets the highlight of the one falling away in the Scriptures, doesn't he? God's like that, right? But all the disciples actually backed up Peter, and they all said the same thing. None of us will do this. None of us will fall away. We'll go to death with you, Jesus 
Well, the reality is that the weakness of the disciples' faith wasn't known until it was tested. And that's the way things work, right? We don't know our own strength of the faith that we have until we go through trials. God knows it, but he allows us to go through trouble. He allows us to go through persecution. He allows us to go through difficulty so that we might see just how strong or perhaps weak our faith might be. Listen, for a long time in our country, it was acceptable to be a Christian, uh, especially in the South, right? Uh, Yet for many years, uh, there has been an acceptable Christianity that is more liberal, that that does not say that the Word of God is is authoritative, the Word of God is not perfect, it can be molded and shaped to our comforts and our society's comforts. And, And then there's the unacceptable Christianity That's the more conservative. The Word of God is the Word of God. Whether you don't like it or not, God has spoken, and it is true. Well, the world tolerated followers of Jesus as long as we weren't too public with it. If we were too public with it, then we were those extreme Christians, those fundamentalists. And many took their Christianity with them and went into hiding. The problem with this is that lost pagans and false Christians took over much of the world around us because they weren't in hiding. They went public with their doubts of God's Word and their preferring other gods or no God at all. In fact, they took over much of our education system from college down to kindergarten and even our libraries. They took over our governmental agencies from presidents down to senators and even in the court system. And they weren't done. They also took over religious institutions. They took over our churches and they took over our missions organizations. And this is what they have tried to make popular Christianity. And guess what? If you hold firm to the genuine Christianity, oh, you're one of those bigots. You're one of those intolerant Christians. Listen, are there intolerant Christians? Absolutely. But the world thinks anyone that holds firm to the Scriptures with love, grace, and truth is an intolerant, bigoted fundamentalist. And they need to die. Well, this is where we find ourselves today. A time of testing of genuine faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. And has He spoken and will we live according to what He has said? Or will we go along to get along? Will we so water down our faith that we make it acceptable to this world and yet unsavable of sinners? Will we be scattered when the devil and his wolves bear their teeth? Truth is, we like these disciples probably all think that our faith is stronger than it is. If it's my life, you know, for claiming to be a Christian, I will lay my life down. Yes, I think if as I, I was in that position, I would say yes, I will not deny Christ. Well, sometimes that doesn't take, you know, someone threatening you with a gun. Sometimes it just takes a scowl, a negative look, a a negative word, a posting, uh, or something like that, or name-calling is all it takes. It doesn't even take a threat anymore. We're too far downstream from the silent Christians. We've now become the fearful ones. Let's do what the disciples didn't do. Not look to our own strength, but let's look to Christ and His victory. Because the truth is, you and I are not strong. We are not the strength that we rely on to get through this world and hold firm to Christ. Look with me, John 16, 33. This is Christ's victory. I have said these things to you. Remember, He's just highlighted to them, we're ready to die for you. And he's like, no, you're going to betray me within less than 24 hours. And so he tells them where they ought to put their strength. I've said these things to you that in me, not in yourselves, in me that you would have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Christian, settle that in your mind. If you stand firm with Christ, the world will stand firm against you. Unless you're not then the world will welcome you, pat you on the back and say, that's the kind of Christian I like. One that's silent and that denies Christ, denies His Word. Jesus says this, but take heart. 
take comfort. Take comfort. Tribulation's coming, yet my peace is there for you. Why should you take comfort? Because Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus is victorious over this world. You say, Chris, I look around. That is not what I see. I do not see Christ's victory over the world. Well, let's look at some scriptures. In fact, let's look at some passages of scripture that we've already looked at and some others that show Christ is the conquering king and he's ruling right now. And you can live as unashamed ambassadors under the king in this world. It's going to bring trouble, but you can have peace. Jesus, first of all, defeated the devil's temptation. We're going to fly through showing you Jesus is king here. Jesus is victor here. Matthew 4, 10 through 11. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus, unlike Adam, did not fail when temptation came his way. He stood firm. He was the victor over the devil's temptation. Secondly, Jesus said that he bound up the strong man, which is why he could cast out demons. Look with me at Matthew 12. This is often overlooked. Matthew 12, 28 through 29. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In the ministry of Christ and in the message of Christ, the kingdom of God was present among the people. And it was a conquering kingdom. It was not a kingdom saying, oh, I I just hope that we're able to build something here, something small, that it can endure all the difficulties that are going to come their way. No, Jesus says, I have overcome. Look, or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds the strong man. How was Jesus able to cast out demons? Because he was more mighty than the devil. The devil had no claim on him. He had authority over the devil. Make no mistake. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. Jesus came to to, to plunder the devil's house. Don't you love that? (laughs) The Apostle Paul tells us Jesus defeated Satan through his death. Hebrews 2.14, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things. He took on flesh. He was God for all eternity, took on flesh. That through death, Jesus is death, Jesus might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. It was on the cross, Christ showed who was king, who was God. And it wasn't Satan, it was Jesus. And he defeated the devil there. Make no mistake. In fact, the devil's already been judged. Uh, We just saw in John 16, 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. How How could the devil be judged unless there was one who had authority over him? A judge judges those who are under him. Jesus is king, ruler, victorious, and he judged the devil. And that sentence has yet to be carried out. It will be. Revelation 20.10, Jesus doesn't get it wrong. The Word of God does not falsely prophesy. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and there they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Who is the ruler of this world? It's not the devil. It's Jesus. King Jesus has defeated the devil, plundered his house, and is ruling and reigning, has already defeated him on the cross, and is just awaiting the day to carry out the sentence already pronounced on him. Jesus is victorious. Is victorious. Jesus not only defeated the devil, but in Matthew 28, 18, tells us he's the one that is ruling on earth. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Satan is not the supreme authority on this earth. Amen? Jesus defeated and is ruling and reigning. And how long will he rule and reign? 1 Corinthians 15, 25. For he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. This is not a weak, limp-wristed savior. This is a conquering king who's victorious over all things. And you and I do not need to be fearful Christians and silent in our homes. We can be bold for Christ. Why? Because we're so strong? Absolutely not. But because Christ 
is the one in whom we find our strength. He is the victorious one. In fact, I want to read to you, Martin Luther was messed up on a lot of things, no question, but he had some things right. Listen to what he said about Jesus being Christus victor. The victory of the Savior means that he takes away the law, kills my sin, destroys my death in his body, and in this way empties hell, judges the devil, crucifies him, throws him down into hell. In other words, everything that once used to torment and oppress me, Christ has set aside. He has disarmed it and made it a public example of it, triumphing over it in himself. Hallelujah. If you didn't get all that, you can listen to that later. It is something to give God praise for. Jesus is the one who overcame. By his death and resurrection, Jesus is victorious. He is the one that we look to in our weakness. We look to him for strength. In our faithlessness, we look to him who is faithful. And we walk in his victory. We walk in his strength. And in it, he produces his faithfulness in us. 1 John 5, 4, may this encourage your souls. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Is it because you're so mighty? Is it because you're King David and you're supposed to go out and claim, you know, your Goliath in your life? No. (laughs) It's because of in Christ, he's defeated all your enemies already. You just walk in his victory. There's no more enemies left for you to destroy. He's taking care of all of them. Sin, death, hell, and the devil. You just walk in the victory He's won for you. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. You're trusting in Him. Your eyes set on Him. Christ the victor.